So my name is Peter Koch and from the Moon Society. Uh, a couple of years ago I had a chance to go to the Mars Desert Research Station and the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted a first hand look at how the Mars Society operated its analog research station system. Um, after that, I, we arranged to rent the Mars Desert Research Station for a couple of weeks, and the Moon Society crew went to get our feet wet. And after, in the aftermath, we decided that if we were to do analog research, we'd need something, a quite different facility, and that our goals would be quite different too. You see, the Mars Society wants to demonstrate the value and importance of human robotic teams for Mars exploration. Well, we've, on the moon, we've done that in the Apollo program. So we need to move on past that. Uh, the Mars Society could be demonstrating the technologies needed to expand towards uh, settlement on Mars, but that's premature. They really have to start from the ground up first. So that is what we would like to concentrate, demonstrating the technologies needed to stay on the moon and to expand. Uh, th that means, of course, uh, that we would build a modular outpost from the very start. Uh, things of, different kinds of things we'd want to do there, expand the envelope of teleoperations, experiment with how, how much and how complicated tasks we could do teleoperating from Earth. The reason that's important is because it saves personnel on the moon to, uh, to do what only humans can do on site. Uh, we can demonstrate the various ways of applying shielding to the outpost for, for radiation protection and for thermal equilibrium. We can demonstrate self-sufficient food production black water, gray water recycling, production of building materials, and then start expanding using those materials. Uh, test analog expansion modules. Demonstrate how we would store enough power during the day span to get through the night span, and so on. One of our first conclusions is that the uh, all-in-one double tuna can module of the Mars Society that they like is not suitable. This, this architecture was chosen because uh, it packs very well for transit, but uh, it has some serious out, uh, drawbacks. It's very hard to shield because it's a vertical structure. And it involves a lot of up and down ladders, which is the second cause of accidents at the Mars Desert Research Station. Uh, now, we can build modular. The people in Calgary are looking at a modular mobile setup. And the advantage there is, is in logistics. Uh, they don't have to go to their remote site, their analog site, where they're going to put it up and work on everything. They work on it in Calgary, and when the module is done, they drive it or tow it to the location. That's a very good idea. Um, this is an old NASA uh, uh, illustration of what a modular outpost could be like, and that gives you a uh, general look. Now, how can we do this cheaply? You have to pick your battles, and uh, being faithful to the, architecturally faithful, is probably not the battle we need to, to, to work with. On the other hand, 
it, there is a very real value to appearances uh, that are to simulating the appearances because it puts you in the mood. Well, it, it occurred to me that a Quonset hut, which you can buy very cheaply, prefab, uh, when it's covered with with uh, regolith or soil or whatever, looks a lot like a uh, very cylinder. We can get a Quonset 20 foot, foot wide, 10 feet high, 40 foot long, for $7,000. It takes about $100,000 just to build the outer shell of the Mars ham. So we could get 12 concept, 12 concepts for less than what the Mars Society paid for their one shell. Of course, we'd have to outfit it with utilities and everything else. This gives you the uh, general idea of what the size of one of those would be. And of course they are available in other sizes. We're not locked into anything. We're just doing a, uh, a notional expansion here. Modular architecture is one thing. Uh, something that nobody is talking about is the modular biosphere. If you build your biosphere components, you know, your, your greenhouse and your uh, water recycling and your waste biomass recycling all in one unit, sized to a few modules. Then you add another module, it's not adequate anymore. So our idea is to have a, a biospheric component of some sort in each module so that as the outpost grows, as the settlement grows, the biosphere grows with it. Uh, one idea is the this wastewater uh, black water treatment system, which was devised by NASA environmental engineer William Wolverton. Uh, and he built it in his home as a demonstration, and it's been operating for close to 30 years. Torn it flushes into a side sideways into a tank with uh, inoculated with the microbes which break down the solids and destroy all the pathogens. The water then go passes into further down the line and uh, we have a succession of uh, swamp plants, marsh plants, and then soil plants that continue to purify the water. When the water gets out at the end of the loop, it's 95% treated. Now in his home, there's, the wood, there's a window wall all along here, so it gets plenty of light. There's zero odor, because his wife said that she would kill him if there was. Uh, the air is fresh and sweet. Uh, plenty of greenery, some flowers, and, and you get your water pre-treated. So if every module that, that uh, is either a habitat or an activity uh, area for humans had a system like this, then the central, the problem that has to be treated in the central facility is greatly reduced. Another idea uh, is the living wall system. Uh, if you put your plants along the wall, they don't take up too much floor space. Uh, the, the one illustrated here in Baltimore, 110 square feet, filters all the air for a 7,500 square foot office building. That's considerable. Uh, so if, if we had our modules connected by corridors and all the corridors were, had one wall given to a living wall operation, uh, that would take care of, of a lot of our fresh air. Uh, there is a what there's a filtration system the, the water trickles down through the through the wall and gathers in the, in the pond in the bottom and that uh, that system can, is also capable of handling some gray water and treating that we'd also want to do modular utilities instead of a centralized utilities there should be some capacity 
to produce a backup electric power, uh, have some water storage, some thermal capacity, some food rations in, in each module. Uh, of course, you have your centralized systems, but they do break down, and you want to be able to survive. This is just a, an idea for a first phase. It shows a dormitory where people will be living, and a workshop where we're making components that we're going to use in the coming modules. It shows uh, a couple of corner units that have the living wall system and uh, a, a green hat, uh, hub. Above we see the, where the commons room would be in the future. That would be meal preparation, uh, dining, rec recreation, so on. The future greenhouse. The idea of the green hub is, is a pleasant place that people would be passing through regularly. Uh, you could be lined with a living wall, it could have a fountain, it could have a, 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 a dome ceiling, maybe matte blue backlit with, uh, with yellow light to, to, to make it give an outdoor feeling. Here's a phase two. You have the added uh, at the top in the center, the, uh, the commons area with the kitchen, meals, music, hobbies, career, uh, games, so on. And to the right of that, a fitness, spa, sauna area. You could have it as a dance floor, table sports, the gym, those kind of things. There's no, at the Mars Desert Research Station, there is no uh, area set aside for physical fitness. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you can, of course, you can play games at the kitchen table. That's about it. Then we're showing our first green hab. Now, this could be something like, uh, like Sadler showed us uh, that, uh, and Patterson, what they've done at the uh, South Pole. And uh, we could try that system, and we could experiment with other systems as well. And it shows a command module now. Uh, in the, with the first phase, the, the headquarters would be shared with the workshop area. Here's a food grid, the food growth chamber at uh, the South Pole Station. If you were here earlier, you, you saw how this works. It's uh, overpressurized slightly, and the air is uh, has got excess carbon dioxide, and it's over illuminated. Uh, this small 10 by uh, 18 foot chamber produces enough salad, uh, fresh vegetables for two meals a day for each of 75 people at the South Pole. It's a remarkable achievement. Uh, and this, this is the work of the University of Arizona, uh, Closed Environment Agriculture Center. Uh, and, you know, while it has been encouraged by NASA, uh, this is a, something done outside. NASA has now closed all its uh, biological life support uh, research the Bioplex at Houston and research done at uh, Purdue is now stopped. So it's up to people on the outside to contribute this. This is another idea uh, for a highly automatable greenhouse in a ring mold or even a torus uh, configuration. You could have the terminator between dawn and, and, uh, and sunrise and between su sunset uh, rotate around so that every area had like maybe 16 hours of light and then eight of darkness. And meanwhile, your equipment that maintains everything, that the plants would, would uh, go around in a circular track around and around and around instead of going one end and then coming back. 
so it, it would lend itself to a high degree of teleoperation or robotics. Now here's an idea for an expanded setup. Phase, the phase two is the part in the middle, but we've acted uh, in the upper left, we've added a factory that's starting to produce things out of lunar materials um, at an analog base. If we had a supply of basalt, we could start uh, experimenting with cast basalt objects, for example. We could do some concrete stuff. Uh, try other things. On the upper right, we've added uh, uh, place that receives things coming from Earth. Uh, so anything coming to the analog station from the outside would come in here as an Earth vehicle garage, uh, EVA prep office, uh, shipping and receiving office. There's a warehouse for things coming in. Down below we have a, a contact uh, facility added. It's a media room, a radio TV station visitor center, so on. On the other side, we've added uh, uh, another farm or greenhouse module. Uh, the whole idea here, I mean, this is not, doesn't have to be the way it is, but we're, we'd want to model how a lunar outpost could, could expand uh, step by step by step and become really, uh, make real progress towards uh, self-sufficiency. Now, what we just saw would fit in the main analog outpost complex. It would be nice if we had a location for this in an area where there was a, a nearby lava tube. Um, but we can do without that if there isn't. The idea is that in a lava tube, since it's dark all the time, by using artificial light, you could easily simulate two weeks of day span and two weeks of uh, night span. And uh, the picture there is from Young's Cave in Bend, Oregon, where uh, in the 90s, uh, the Oregon Moon Base had its uh, facility. Uh, something, a structure like this, a dome yurt, is very uh, spacious, it's cheap, and it compacts easily to be brought in. And, through narrow openings, and it would fit in there. But there are other ways to, to simulate that. Uh, we could simply have one unit with blacked out, no, no windows or cues to what it, that it's like outside. Uh, you could have fake windows inside that would be backlit for uh, 14, 15 days in a row, and then dark the same amount of period. And uh, crews would go outside during what it is what it is actually daylight during for two weeks. And then in the following two weeks, the only time crews would go outside is when it is actually dark outside. So it could be you could simulate uh, the lighting situation quite simply. Um, what what we kind of research we do there? Well, we want to push the limits of teleoperation, so we could have some equipment there and try to to uh, control it remotely. And this is a lot to, uh, not by crews at the site, but maybe in university schools anywhere. This is an opportunity for our students to get involved. Uh, we can experiment with different ways of shielding. Uh, deploying shielding. Um, the common way of thought is just to pile it up over your shelter, your module. Uh, there are various ways to elaborate that. Some would su suggest building blocks or bricks and bricking it up because those are easily removable if you had to have access to, to your module for make repairs or to add another unit or whatever. But uh, more and more, uh, I'm leading, and it looks like the Mars Home Foundation people are too, 
to the idea of just putting up a big hangar or, or a type of, uh, of structure and shielding that and then you just put your modules inside. That way you can have access to the outside of the modules if you need to for any reason. It's easy to add mod modules. You just park them under there. Uh, we, could, we could experiment with different ways of, of piping in sunlight. Uh, we could experiment with different versions of a periscopic picture window. I know people say just use a TV screen. A TV screen can be fake and it's not satisfactory. I, I saw a home in Wisconsin in 1985. It was underground, eight feet underground, and every wall had picture windows. And, and behind the picture window was a, a, a huge 45 degree mirror and another one at the top, and, uh, and you had the feeling that you were looking directly out on the countryside when you were really quite uh, very. Uh, we could, uh, in the dormitory area, you have a certain amount for each room. Uh, we, could, we could have uh, competitions uh, to design the modules uh, each each quarter, and pick the top designs, and then crew members could decide which was which seemed to be work out best. Um, we want to do a good job of dust control. Uh, Mars Desert Research Station is the dustiest place that I've ever been in. Uh, not at all tight, and they do nothing to stop migration of dust from the outside, uh, the soil outside, inside. Uh, simple things that could be done are expanded metal grading for porches and steps, uh, paved aprons around the airlock entrances, boot cleaners, tight hull with air exchanger and so on. Uh, we could do research on early lunar materials. Uh, for example, cast basalt. If we had our um, analog station in a basaltic area, we'd have a source of materials. Uh, there's already a lot of research, a lot of stuff done on Earth. In Czechoslovakia, they make uh, industrial uh, tiles, uh, floor tiles. That are really, some of them are quite beautiful. They're very thick, about it, almost an inch thick. Uh, in South America, they're using cast basalt to make uh, pipe fittings uh, for materials handling systems because they're very abrasion resistant. We can experiment with making raw grass from, from simulant uh, to see if you can know, fashion that into household items that you need that wouldn't have to be imported from Earth because you're making them there. There's all sorts of things we could get into. Uh, we could Try to, uh, we could produce silane, which is a silicon analog of methane, and uh, we could do that on the moon and try and see if we could rig up a generator that would run on it. So just an idea. All sorts of ideas. We do a lot of experimenting with biosphere options. The, just because we had many modules, we could keep varying the setup we had from one module to the other to see what works best. Uh, we want to experiment with testing robotic and teleoperated agriculture systems. If we can have the, the greenhouses mostly managed from the outside by students or whatever, uh, that would free up personnel to do other things. Uh, storing day span power for night span use, that's the, the big boogeyman that's scaring everybody to the poles, which I personally believe is a dead end. Uh, so we can store 
we could gather power during the day span with solar concentrators or solar panel arrays. We can store that power in flywheels, battery banks, and fuel to run generators. And there are other options too. Another thing we can do is experiment with scheduling operations to take advantage of the fact that on the moon, no matter what kind of power setup you're going to have, you're always going to have more of power during the day span than during the night span. One way to do this is save the, the energy intensive activities, construction, soil moving, materials processing, manufacturing, storing the power for the day span. And during the night span, do the energy light activities, equipment maintenance, uh, equipment overhauling, inventory, warehouse work, uh, energy light product finishing, packaging, design work. Most of the free time could be at night, arts and crafts, so on. Uh, schedule, scheduling what you do when is part of the solution to the, to the uh, getting through the long nighttime period. We all could also uh, experiment with uh, plant lighting. Uh, in the early 90s, we had found, founded uh, Lunax Corporation, uh, the Lunar Ex National Experiment, Agricultural Experiment Corporation, to, find, to interest students in, in, uh, and uh, science uh, teachers with doing experiments to determine just how much or how little light we need and what kind of lighting pattern to nurse plants through the night span so that they would eventually go on to harvest. We could continue that kind of research. We could experiment with our diet. Uh, we did this in our, our ex exercise in Utah. We had a strictly vegetarian diet and we had uh, uh, for our gala meal towards the end of the exercise we had tilapia. Tilapia is a fish that grows well in greenhouse based water treatment systems. Now the Mars Society uh, research program uses all of these except the teleoperations table. You have a program management team, you have on-site crews, of course, you have a CAPCOM team, and there's a remote set research team to turn to for advice and questions. But we would have, uh, be big into teleoperations also. Uh, public outreach. Well, we'd have students for teleoperations teams maintaining this greenhouse system remotely. Uh, students could operate the, an on-site radio and TV broadcast studio uh, by, I just did a little quick check, and Radio Moon Base Earth, those, those uh, call letters are available. Um, student design competitions could determine many of the outpost features. Public outreach programs. Some people think we should incorporate a visitor center. I, uh, having been there, I am adamantly opposed to uh, having uh, well, to having them too close together because if there, are, if if, if uh, you know you're being observed or if you can see observers, that destroys the mood of simulation entirely uh, and it's very distractive. But what we could do, I, I think, is to build a, uh, like one module, which is similar to what we have at the, at the actual site, where people could see what it's like, and, that, and they could have webcams to the, uh, showing what's actually going on at the site. Uh, at the site, there could be a hiking trail with several duck bind type observation points where they could see the terrain and uh, maybe see some activity, but nobody would, none of the crew would see them. Uh, someday we could have a moonlight motel, which would be furnished in, in 
lunar frontier style. There's all sorts of things that are, we could do. So uh, we're open to suggestions. This is just the suggestions. We're in the define and design phase right now. We want to really, really be careful, carefully elaborate what we want to do and determine the, the most effective ways of doing everything and then present it to potential funders for a startup one phase at a time. Uh, you can get hold of me right there very easily. And if you forget that, if you remember how my last name is spelled, you go to Google, almost everything you find will meet is me because it's an unusual name. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Hi, Peter. It's Jim Davis from Houston. Uh, my question is on the silane. Where do you get the hydrogen? Where do you get the what? Hydrogen. I know where you get the silicon from. Right. Where's hydrogen? The, there's hydrogen everywhere on the moon. It's not, not very much of it, but it's in the, the upper two meters of the soil. It's put there by the solar wind. And if we adopt uh, an ethic of whenever we are handling moon dust, whether we're moving it around to create shielding, whether we're grading, we're making roads, whether we're using it to put uh, to process it to something else, if first we heat it up to 600 degrees Celsius, we drive off those solar wind volatiles the greatest percentage of which is, is hydrogen protons. Um, doing that and then collecting them and separating them, you know, we, we get hydrogen, we get helium, and of course helium-3 is one, one, one molecule out of 4,000 is a helium-3 rather than helium-4. Uh, carbon, nitrogen, uh, even some of the, uh, like neon, argon, and so on. Uh, if we don't do that, then we have to import it. But it's there, and, and it, it, I, it requires a rigorous ethic that all regular handling equipment have to be so equipped that we'll set ourselves up. The enhancement at the poles is actually only three times as much as is in the regular everywhere. Um, so it's a case of, and then of course, everything we have, we have to recycle as vigorously as possible. It'd be a different way of living because, uh, you know, on Earth our volatiles are so abundant, we just throw everything away. Don't recycle at all, very little. Any more? No, I have, we haven't gone into that. We, uh, we realize that you're going to have to study it to death. I mean, this is a very, very general outline of what we, of a way to do it, and certainly open up, uh, open up to alternate suggestions as well as we have to go into all these little details. Yeah. If you want to bring out your checkbook right now, <laughs> I did get an email a couple weeks ago from somebody I've known for a long time. It's a woman, and she has moved to California. She used to live in the Great Lakes area, and she wanted to know what I was up to, and I told her, and I explained this. She says, well, by the time you're ready to go, I may be ready to fund you. Now, <laughs> obviously I can't hold her up to that, 
but she says she's been busy developing multiple streams of income that are sort of automatic, so I don't know what that means. But using the modular system, obviously you can break it down into pieces for funding. And as you've got one thing there and it's working and proving that that gives you some uh, respectability when you go and ask to, to do something else. Uh, the, the station, the Mars station on Devon Island cost $200,000 to manufacture, more to, more to deliver, and, and to outfit. The one in Utah, the, the original manufacturer being busy, they had to find somebody else. They found somebody who did it for half the price. And of course, that had to be outfitted too. Um, but there, there have been really no additions. There's a small, what they call a green hat, attached to each, and all it does is uh, treat um, uh, water from the sinks and showers so it can be reused to flush the toilets. So that's, and that's the limit of their biosphere life support system. Uh, not very much. And there's no mod other modularity than that except what we did on our crew, Moon Society crew last year. We bit, built a, a framework of a tunnel from the Green AF to the HAB so that the crew members could pretend they could walk through that space without putting on a spacesuit. So but we had to build it as a framework so that we would uh, not prevent any obstacle to the winds out there, which are, can get quite strong. Scotty, anything? Okay. So uh, right now, uh, all we're doing is packing away at the design. We have to make it a lot more specific so we can really pin down with the numbers. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, coins are not $7,000 delivered. You have to have a foundation, you have to build the utilities, everything, you know, so we have to pin all that down so we can have real numbers to show somebody. And so that we know what to do if somebody gives us the money. Right. Uh, as for places, we've looked at, uh, a couple of places in Utah, not too promising. Uh, one about 80 miles west of Albuquerque in the Grants area. And uh, the old, original Oregon Moon Base site is no longer available. But uh, near Craters of the Moon National Park, you've got Idaho Na National uh, engineering laboratory and the director there one of the things he wants to encourage on this vast site is lunar analog activity so that's a possibility uh, while we were there i had purchased uh, some large green sunglasses and since i had a chance to go out there because bbc was doing a photo shoot before we, our actual mission, I took them along, and they were they were really great. Uh, they the oranges turned to whites and grays, so it got the colors out, but the landforms were still Martian. And then we tried tinting the windows of the ham, and that didn't work at all. So yeah, you want a site where you can help it, you can pretend. So you want, you know, gray tones are better, the less vegetation, the better. Uh, but there's a certain, it depends what you're, what you're going to try to simulate, what, what you're going to try to do. There's no reason why we couldn't do this thing here and that thing there. I mean, you could do things in a, in a big closed warehouse, if it, as long as it wasn't geology, you know, so. Um, they uh, are going to be building a lunar analog facility at Mauna Kea. The Hawaiian government and is involved in that. 
and uh, they've got a number of scientists and universities involved. Right now, they're, they're just going, setting up the legal stuff for that. I have no idea what they're planning. But that's a far way to go. See, originally, the Mars Society picked Devon Island because there's, there's a large crater there that's 20 million years old and very little vegetation and uh, the temperature range is it's nice and cold like Mars, not, not nearly as cold as Mars. The only problem they have is polar bears and they always have to carry a rifle, but it's a short, short season. And the number one problem is the logistics. It costs you to, to go to uh, Devon Island cost you anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 round trip airfare via either Edmonton or Ottawa. So that's why they built one in, in Utah, thinking that they would have a much longer season. It is easier to get to. Salt Lake City is the, the staging point. But um, by mid-April, it gets too hot. And in the middle of winter, the pipes keep freezing. I, I don't know what, what they were thinking of. You know, I mean, if, I'm from Wisconsin. If I had, had done the plumbing system, it would never have frozen because I know how to do things like that. But uh, still, after six years, we're still having problems with frozen pipes. But uh, you know, you have the high-profile hat and. Uh, Bob Zubrin doesn't want to, even on Mars, doesn't want to bother with shielding. He says, oh, that little bit of radiation won't hurt anybody. Most people disagree with him. But it's, how do you shield something that high? If they had a, a ranch-style setup and just piled mulch bags over it, you know, it, that would help with the thermal equilibrium. It would probably get them, get them through a couple months of the summertime they might have to uh, leave their excursions go to the evening hours or the early morning hours, but they could still operate. So, anyway, so basically, you know, we, the things we want to do different is the Mars Society is trying to demonstrate that humans and having humans and robot teams is a good idea on Mars. We've done that with Apollo. We don't have to do that. So we can go on further how do we how do we demonstrate going from an initial setup to an expand ever expanding outpost in towards the direction of settlement demonstrate those technologies so we want to do it modular modular by spheres and uh, and test not just and you want to test all different kinds of things different options one thing that the Mars people missed is they had the, the, the architecture they used to outfit the HAB in Devon Island, the floor plans, where everything was. They just copied it for Utah. It was a perfect opportunity to try something different and see if the economic, which one was more ergonomic. They missed that. They were in a hurry to get it done because they needed the publicity. I understand that. Uh, the the Eurohab, the Europeans were in charge of doing that, and uh, they've gone wild with the interior, including a, a spa. And Bob just thinks that's terrible for pioneers to have something like that. Well, you know, if you're gone from Earth for three years, <laughs> right. You better have some perks, you know, uh, to keep up morale. Morale is so important, you know, no matter how good every other system is, if the human system fails, you're sunk. And you've got to build in creature comforts. You've got to see that there's no exercise place or anything at MDRS. Huh? That isn't running polar bears in Well, yeah. So, when, when they go on excursions, somebody always rides shotgun. <laughs> James. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Tree is a uh, sociologist. He's uh, running astrosociology.com. He has another angle for an analog station. He wants to test 
uh, how humans and human society operates under these. Uh, oh, sectors. sure. And in fact, you know, what there's a talking... complication, though. The science that he wants to have is he's thinking the minimum number of people to have is more than 100. I can't remember the exact figure. Right. Yet. Right. It, and I agree with you. The, how do we get them? Yeah, it's straight. How do we get them there? Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, that's something I've, I've written about frequently. You've got to stress the perks. you got to get it so that people will say, okay, I'll do another tour of duty. Because every time you do another tour of duty, that means some somebody else can come up from Earth. You know, you're saving money. Uh, but a, a frontier can be defined as, as a place where there are always too many things to do and people to do them. Everybody's got to have mul multiple uh, abilities, expertise, so on. Uh, and you, by the time you, yes, you need you need that many people a minimum to have something that was sustainable and work work. Yeah, but you have to get there from from very few. Uh, one one way to do it is to have a lot of the things as much as possible at a lunar outpost done remotely from Earth because that frees the people who are there to do the things that can't be done remotely. Uh, uh, human factors, there's been a lot of research on human factors at both Mars stations. But the thing that they're not mod modeling is uh, people there for a long time. If you're only there for two weeks, anybody can put up with anything for two weeks. You have another question, Jay? Well, just the obvious one. When can, when, when can you've got the, you know, you have people who are helping you with this, working on the thing. When can we start seeing this all on Lunarpedia.org? When can we what? When can we start seeing it all on Lunarpedia.org? Shameless plug here. Okay. Did you hear that? Yes. Lunar, can you see it on Oh. <laughs> well, right, right now, what you saw uh, is something I worked up last fall, and this is like the fifth version of it. And the last several months, I've had no time to work on it because I've been preparing for the conference. But I, I need to do, you know, all of the too much that's left undefined. I need to do a lot more. But if you want me to put something up there, I, I could do that. Uh, All I have to do is stop writing Moonbinders Manifesto and I can get full time to Wikipedia.org. So find me, a, find me a substitute editor. Yeah, anybody, any volunteer, sub volunteer assistant or sub assistant editor is here. I can't type a 61 page newsletter a month. <laughs> he can. Now, but, in Calgary, they're going to be doing something analogous. They're starting with the, the mobile is the mobile uh, modular architecture. So they build everything in Calgary, which saves them from running, uh, using all their money and all their time running to and from the actual site. And then they'll, they'll trailer it or truck it or drive it to the location. And uh, uh, one of the things I borrowed from Mike here is uh, that his first module is the command module, and the second one is the workshop. Because with, if you have a workshop, you can start building things on location, and that's a really good idea. I don't even think that there's any kind of workshop, tool shop, fabrication shop in the NASA setup. I'm not aware of it. They want everything there ready to use, and they're assuming that nothing will ever break down. I don't know. Well, of course, on Mars, you better have a workshop because if you're missing one screw for one vital system, and the next shipment is two years away, you're up a creek. <laughs> Well, this is this is fun. The the thing is, 
uh, yeah, we not only need to get it up to Litterpedia, but we, we have to have to keep the membership encouraged and show progress. Uh, and that's something, too. Um, I think it would be, you know, given that we how much money we had to spend to rent the Mars Desert Research Station and the fact that it really isn't suitable, it, it would serve no purpose at all to do another exercise there. Does the Society talk to Bob Bigelow at all? Yes, talk to what? To Bob Bigelow. I understand he has like, some neat ideas for working with Relith. Well, I think one thing we'd like to try is an inflatable module. But, uh, you no, know, we have, you know, Greg Bennett, who was the founder of the New Society, used to work for Bob Bigelow. But he quit after a short time because of apparently personal clash. And uh, too bad because Bigelow's making great strides. Now, you know, the Bigelow modules, the, the, the envelope is like 11 or 12 inches thick. That's because it's designed for orbit where there's so much space to breathe. But if it was just designed to hold pressure, it could be much, much thinner. And, you know, if you were building them and then parking them under a hangar, which was, was shielded, you wouldn't, they wouldn't have to be that thick, which means that for the payload bay that they're shipped in, the envelope could actually be much Luminous, right? So that that's a that's a something we'd like to experiment with too. Well, also might provide an opportunity to uh, test out his ideas. Oh, sure. Society to be able to see. Lock up. Now we talked yesterday about the University of Luna project, where we wanted to encourage research and development of technologies needed on the moon. A lunar analog station would be a place where all these things could be tested, or at least some of these things could be tested. Uh, especially regolith handling systems and things like that. Now, the Mars people do a lot of geology. We wouldn't be doing that because the field, field work, a lot of field work has already been done. I mean, but if they come up with new systems they want to try, I suppose you could do that too. And the Mars people also have exobiology stuff, but that wouldn't apply either. Yeah, I guess we're next. We talk to each other. <laughs>